Okay. Um, I think we're just going to start the webinar. We have about 62 people um, on the call. Um, my name is Damolo Olade. Um, I'm the head of the uh, SADAC for Financial Inclusion program at FIMAC Trust. I'd like to welcome everybody, all 64 of you and counting, to um, a webinar that's looking at the research findings from our cross-border remittances from South Africa to the rest of SADAC uh, research work. Um, it's the third time that we're doing this. We started this journey in 2012. The second one was in 2016. And then we commissioned uh, research last year um, with the assistance of uh, Genesis Analytics and DNA Economics in putting this work together. Um, Cross-border remittances is in the static region is one of our, our key thematic areas at uh, FIMAC Trust. And we are really excited uh, by the response from those that are still joining us. We are at 70 at the moment. Um, we really appreciate your um, participation in this webinar. Would like to thank our donors, um, UK Aid, for supporting this program. Um, would also like to thank the South African Reserve Bank um, for um, partnering with us in terms of providing uh, leadership from a policy perspective, regulatory perspective, also furnishing us with the uh, requisite data that we require to be able to size the market. Um, with that said, um, I would like to mention some housekeeping um, details to guide this um, webinar. So the webinar will be uh, executed in three phases. Uh, the first will be uh, an intro which will be delivered by my colleague, uh, Magedi Titus Tokwane, who is a senior manager um, with the Regional Settlement Services at the South African Reserve Bank. He's gonna provide some introductory remarks for about 10 minutes. And then right after that, I will be getting into the actual findings from the research that we've put together. And uh, that should take about um, 30 minutes. Um, Titus would have about 10 minutes. And then the remaining of the webinar will be allocated to questions and answers. Um, kindly use the chat box at the bottom of the screen uh, to uh, let us know um, your comments, uh, to also let us know if you have specific questions. And one of my colleagues who's supporting this webinar, Komoto, would then communicate those questions to Titus and myself. Um, so with that said, um, I am going to introduce uh, Titus now to give us the introductory remarks so we can get on with this. Um, Komoto, can you please put up uh, Titus's uh, 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 card? Um, and then Titus uh, comes on board to, to present the introductory remarks. Titus, you will be required to unmute yourself. Okay, uh, good morning colleagues, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, you're clear. I can hear you clearly. I'm sure everybody else okay. can. Yes. Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to, 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 to make sure. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I would like to welcome you to uh, this um, webinar um, in partnership with the, the FinMark Trust. My name is uh, Advocate Mahedi Tatastokwane. I'm from the South African Reserve Bank. Uh, I will be talking to you um, in my capacity as the previously the SADEC Payment System uh, Project Manager. It is a role that I've uh, uh, fulfilled for the last eight years about. And in that um, role, uh, I have been fortunate to uh, work with the region on a journey of um, integrating uh, the payment system uh, efforts in the region, and among other things, um, implementing uh, efforts and um, initiatives around the, the remittances. Uh, just to, you can go to the next slide. Komozo, you can go to the next slide.
Okay, thank you. Uh, in terms of my, my key points that I will, I will touch on, um, I will just give you a, 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 a view of uh, the CCBG and the SADC um, Regional Payment System Integration Project and the, the historical context of the, the SA SADC uh, remittances in terms of the regional uh, economic perspective and financial inclusion. And then um, I will touch on the, the current uh, uh, SADC payment system integration initiative insofar as remittances and low value payments is concerned. And then I'll just uh, give you my thoughts about the impact of COVID-19 uh, on, on remittances. The CCBG stands for Committee of Central Bank Governors. It is a structure under the uh, SADC uh, Secretariat. It uh, falls under the, the uh, or reports to the ministers uh, that are responsible for uh, finance and investment in the, the SADC region. And the ministers obviously reports to, to the heads of, of state. Under the Committee of Central Bank Governors, you have various um, subcommittees that deals with um, uh, central banking and banking uh, related uh, initiatives. Among others, we've got um, a payment system, uh, we've got banking supervision, um, then we've got the, the legal subcommittee, uh, we've got financial markets, and we've got um, the SADC Banking Association as one of the, the groupings that um, reports to, to, to the governors. Then uh, the work that the the, that formalizes the, the, the structures under the governors is articulated in the, the SADC FIB. The SADC FIB, it is a SADC protocol on investment, uh, uh, finance and investment. And under FIB, you've got the various annexes of which Annex 6 uh, provide the institutional arrangements for the payment uh, system. Among others, uh, in terms of the mandate that has been given to the payment systems, include the integration of a payment system uh, in the region, the development of payment systems and, and the region. And the remittances is one of the key pillars that the, the committee uh, look, looks into. Uh, historically, what has been happening in the SADC, SADC region was that there hasn't been um, uh, remittance uh, uh, products to, to speak of. Uh, as you know, uh, about 10 years ago, you had institutions like um, um, Western Union and MoneyGram when they were standalone institutions offering uh, remittance services. What happened then was that um, people were using informal channels to send money across the, the SADC uh, the region. And the products that were there were very, very expensive. I don't know if you recall the cost uh, of uh, remitting money using those channels of uh, Western Union and MoneyGram. In addition to that, there were other channels that you, that you would use, which were formal channels, but those channels were in the banking system. But those channels were not developed for remittances. They were developed for movement of a high value um, uh, transfer of funds. In South Africa, we call those uh, channels telegraphic uh, transfer. Throughout the period, the payment system subcommittee uh, has been working with FINMA Trust and has worked with the World Bank to implement various um, initiatives in the region to uh, bring products to the, to the market and to um, formalize uh, these um, uh, informal uh, channels. The work that we have done with the World Bank um, revolves around the implementation of the general principles for international remittance services. Uh, this is the World Bank initiative and that initiative provide a guidance to countries in terms of implementing uh, measures for uh, remittances in the uh, the various countries and, and regional perspective. 
FinMark Trust has been a partner to, is, has been and is a partner to the SADC payment system uh, subcommittee. Um, it has assisted the, the, sub, uh, the subcommittee in implementing some of the key initiatives that um, the subcommittee has been tasked to, to, to implement. Among others, uh, which are notable, um, are the, the investigation in terms of the legal and regulatory framework on uh, payment systems in the, in the region. And the one that is uh, um, key for today's discussions is around um, remittances. Uh, Finmark Trust has been a partner that um, took ideas that uh, were debated around the table by policymakers in terms of how to get um, uh, the, the remittance cost down and how to get the product uh, developed and implemented in the market. One of the product that um, they have uh, worked with the industry and the, the policy makers in SIDEC, uh, which they have brought to the market, um, is this the, the remittance uh, corridor between South Africa and Lesotho. We just call it the South Africa Lesotho remittance uh, service. This was in partnership with the, uh, the Standard Bank, uh, then uh, and the, the South African Reserve Bank and the Central Bank of Lesotho. That product Today, it is one of the, the, the finer examples of a, a, the public, uh, uh, private, and your central bank partnership that um, if you have that uh, working uh, relationship, you can bring to the market products that are, uh, are, are fast in terms of um, uh, transmitting money, and then products that are very, 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 very cheap. If you take that uh, product that has been put down uh, or developed for South Africa Lesotho corridor in terms of cost, when you compare to the other products that are out there in the market, those products in the market don't compare. And it makes it easy for people to, um, to transfer money uh, between South Africa and uh, Lesotho. My take is that you will see it in the, the key finding of how that product performs, the level of savings that um, uh, it brought to uh, the ordinary users of that, um, that, that service in the, in, in the market. But having said that, from the payment system uh, perspective, um, we are looking into developing um, infrastructures that will aid the flow of money. Uh, uh, in the region. I'm talking about the low value flow of money. From high value perspective, of which I don't want to dwell into, there is already an infrastructure that has been developed. Uh, that infrastructure is called the uh, SADC RTGS. Previously, it was called the Cyrus system. And then that infrastructure will underpin uh, the products that are going to be developed on top of uh, uh, that, that uh, in infrastructure. Now, the, from remittance or low value uh, uh, payments point of view, we are developing, a, we have developed in fact an infrastructure, it is called TCIB. TCIB stands for Transactions Clearing on Immediate Basis. That is a platform that could be uh, utilized to transfer funds from a bank account to bank account a bank account, a, a mobile wallet, and a mobile wallet to a mobile wallet. And those mobile wallets could be uh, held by uh, what we call Atlas in South Africa, or money transfer operators uh, to the rest of uh, SADC, or they could be with the telco operators. What, what we are doing today is that uh, we are just uh, refining some of the business models um, in, on that platform before it, it gets uh, deployed. The idea behind that is that uh, we should uh, have a, a, a solid platform that will aid the, the flow of uh, low value transactions um, um, in the region. And the idea there is that uh, we would, should bring in not only just banks, but have banks on board, money transfer operators on board, and have your telcos um, uh, on board offering or competing on uh, services. And as you know, when you 
open environment like a payment system to uh, additional players you are bringing things of risks but you are bringing competition and when you bring competition prices will go down and then the service providers will compete on uh, service that they will uh, provide to 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 the people having said that uh, I think I will stop right there and then I'll be ready to take questions in this regard. I'll just give, uh, in conclusion, I'll give my thoughts around the impact of COVID-19 on remittances. As you know, uh, the business of remittances um, is dependent on people remitting money. And people that remit money, the, you are mostly uh, people that have moved from one country into another country for job opportunities or business opportunities. And then they will uh, be remitting money to their uh, home countries for, to, to their families. As you know, uh, for South Africa, we have been in a lockdown, level five. Now we are on level four. The level of economic activity has slowed down. And we can pick this uh, uh, up on the, the SADC RTGS system that the, the, the volumes have actually uh, decreased. I think my colleague was telling me that the, the decrease of volumes on a month to month basis is about say 30% or so. So we have seen that uh, decrease in the level of activity uh, from cross-border payments point of view. Now that, if you take that and then you extrapolate, you will understand that then the people that are remitting money are impacted by, uh, uh, by this um, uh, uh, COVID uh, arrangements in terms of the lockdown and the slowdown in uh, economic uh, activity. And that, in my view, is that uh, we would see that uh, from remittance point of view or remitting uh, money point of view, we will see a significant drop in April and May month. And that poses a challenge to the people that are dependent on um, uh, this re remittances for their livelihood. I would like to stop there. I think I have talked a lot. Um, I will hand over to, to my colleague, Damula. Uh, thank you, uh, Titus. Thank you for that. Um, without uh, wasting uh, any more time, I'm just going to go straight into uh, the findings. So um, what I will be presenting uh, will go along the lines of the following. I will spend a little bit of time on background, talk about methodology and data set, um, recount on the evolution of uh, regulation and uh, market participation within the cross-border remittances space, uh, then go into uh, our estimate of migrants, uh, then that would lead into the market size. And once we've completed that, we would focus more on the formal side of the market, looking at transaction size, looking at volumes, looking at values, and also bringing some disaggregated uh, dimension with respect to gender into the conversation. Uh, and then we would uh, speak slightly on some of the uh, persistent drivers of uh, informal usage and then we will go into pricing. Uh, we would say a bit on market uh, innovation. Um, and then uh, the last two sections will look at some of the impact of COVID as we've received it from some of our um, stakeholders within the uh, remittances service provision space. And then we would look slightly at uh, country level drivers. So in terms of background, I, I, Titus has already kind of gone through this uh, mostly. Um, South Africa is the most diversified buoyant economy in the SADC region. And uh, because of that, it uh, gets a lot of uh, economic migrants from the SADC uh, region coming in here looking for uh, a better life. And obviously, um, they are they're required to send money back home to uh, families back home in the, in the other 15 set of countries in the, in the region. Um, so Africa uh, also has uh, major ports um, um, and that uh, obviously that instantiates uh, quite a bit of cross-border trade activities. So um, the economic uh, importance of cross-border payments infrastructure um, is quite, uh, 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 it shouldn't be understated, um, and it, it, it is essentially what has prompted 
um, regional uh, policy to look at uh, ways in which um, the infrastructure, legal frameworks, and the regulatory environment uh, within the region can support uh, the provision of cheap, quick, and convenient cross-border remittances uh, products. Uh, the role of FinMark in this as a market facilitator within the region is to um, look at uh, supporting our uh, uh, regional stakeholders and uh, domestic st stakeholders in terms of generating uh, the, the uh, appropriate data and measurement uh, to inform our advocacy uh, to support uh, the regional integration through uh, um, um, cross-border remittances, if you think about uh, the, the importance of regional financial integration within the region. So I will uh, sort of uh, stop there in terms of the background. From a methodological perspective, um, for us to get to a point in which we can size the market, there are a couple of steps to take there. So the first step is to look at the uh, stock of migrants in South Africa coming from SADC. Um, the second step is uh, uh, around engaging a sample of some of these migrants to understand uh, remittances behavior in terms of frequencies, amounts remitted, their choices of channels. Um, what happens is the step two allows us to form some assumptions around uh, the size of the informal market in this regard. It's very difficult to get a hold uh, or a handle of the size of the informal market. Uh, so uh, that uh, step two allows us to do that. And step three um, is a combination of step one and two, which then gets us to a point where we then estimate uh, the size of the market, breaking this down by formal and informal uh, uh, remittances. From a data set perspective, the step one, which is around getting a sense of migrants, uh, is informed by the South African census. Uh, this is slightly outdated. The last one was in 2011, uh, but uh, we've looked at extrapolating by uh, adding uh, a factor of about 2.5 and looking at how um, migrants per country uh, have increased over time. And uh, some of uh, our estimates there checked out. We'll be sharing the, the larger report and you can get into those details. So in terms of the migrant uh, population, we get that information from the uh, uh, stats essay, the South African census. Uh, the formal remittances, we get that directly from the SARB. And that data set is described at the bottom of your screen um, in terms of uh, the, the balance of payments database. Um, it is not perfect, but it has improved substantially. Um, I will give an example uh, of uh, some of the areas where imperfections can creep in. So for instance, you could have a migrant that has a bank account in South Africa and then send a, a card back home and then you have the family member withdrawing money, making a card transaction in the recipient country. Uh, it's a bit difficult to distinguish this card transaction from say a South African tourist that has gone to that same country, for instance. So there were some adjustments that were made to ensure that we uh, depict uh, the formal remittances flow adequately. And uh, as I've said, there were some uh, uh, qualitative studies around understanding uh, a sample of the migrants. And we also looked at uh, uh, in-depth interviews with some of the uh, remittances service providers to get a sense of the supply side. Um, Titus has already mentioned this, but it's important to also sort of put it back um, uh, uh, into the conversation. So essentially, uh, looking at the evolution of the regulatory space and the market participation space, uh, pre-94, the market was mostly dominated by commercial banks. And then uh, subsequent to that, uh, the SARP introduced the authorized dealers with limited authority, which are essentially non-banks, coming into the marketplace. And that uh, led to the instantiation of business models as uh, uh, Titus described earlier the South African Lesotho corridor where shop rights partners with Standard Bank, for instance, looking at the retail model there. In 2017, there was the advent of uh, amendments to like the FICA uh, uh, laws 
that allows for risk-based approach to onboarding of customers. This allows finance, uh, the, the remittances service providers uh, to make judgments on the risk profiles uh, of customers uh, in order to have uh, a remittances market that is much more inclusive. And as I go uh, uh, further in the presentation, you would see the reasons why uh, inclusivity is quite key in this market. Uh, in 2018, Adler 4 license was introduced, and this allows for what the Saab uh, 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 defines as value uh, uh, remittances, which is essentially goods-based remittances. People can buy goods and remit back home as opposed to uh, actual money. Um, and then in 2019, the, retail, uh, the retailer model was uh, launched in Eswatini. So that kind of gives uh, a sense of the regulatory evolution from mostly predominantly bank-led to uh, a sector where market entry is much more relaxed and we have much more activities by non-banks. Now going to the migrant population estimate, we estimate that 3.7 million migrants uh, within the SADC, from the SADC region live in South Africa. Uh, obviously, we are, we are very um, sure that this is probably inaccurate, but it's the best uh, estimate that uh, we can make and we welcome uh, our collaborations in terms of uh, working through the methodology here. What is quite important to note is that um, about 80% of these migrants come into South Africa uh, either legally and then decide not to go back home because they would like a, a better life. So it turns out that about 80% work in informal uh, uh, in the informal sector, you know, working piecemeal jobs, um, essentially not having the requisite uh, types of ID that will be required by a commercial bank to use uh, the banking system, for instance, to remit money back home, which is why, as Titus mentioned earlier, uh, a majority of this market what is, was historically uh, uh, informal based. So most of the migrants would use informal remittances uh, platforms to send money back home. But as I get further in the presentation, you would see the shift over time. And the table essentially just shows us the top four or five um, migrant uh, uh, countries. And the last column there shows us the percentage of those migrants that are essentially um, working in the informal sector uh, legally uh, not having the right to work in South Africa. So now, uh, the market size. So just to, to recap, as, as I mentioned in the methodology section, we had the, so we, I, I kind of described the, the way in which we get to the estimate of the total market size, which is looking at uh, the, the, the migrant population, trying to uh, form assumptions on the informal market uh, based on some qualitative studies, and then using the actual formal data from the SARB to then extrapolate to what the total market would be. And uh, as of 2018, the total market was 21.87 billion rands, which is just over a million dollars, of which 52% uh, were in the informal uh, uh, sector. Um, as you would see there, uh, there was an increase uh, of about 159% between 2016 and 2018 to have um, informal, uh, well, formal uh, uh, remittances uh, being at 10 billion, 10.5 billion rands uh, at 2018. Um, and we saw a drop of about 24% to 11 billion in 2018. And looking back at the estimates we had in uh, 2016, we've seen an increase of 31% in total market size between 2016 and 2018. What is also important to note is to sort of see the corridors that is driving some of these remittances. As you would see at the bottom chart there, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, uh, Namibia, Mozambique, Malawi, uh, Lesotho are some of the the highest net outflow remittances uh, 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 corridors in the region. So now, uh, going to uh, the transaction sizes, and the transaction sizes are quite key uh, in terms of how we understand um, the level at which 
the market is becoming slightly more inclusive. That is, you have more uh, low income people using formal channels, for instance. Um, uh, the transaction size is also kind of critical when we think about how to uh, analyze pricing within the market. Uh, so if you look at the chart, the scatter plots on the right side of the screen, you can see that Zimbabwe and Malawi, uh, in terms of total number of transactions, is pretty high, but that also intersects with uh, quite relative uh, low transaction sizes, which uh, is indicative that uh, uh, you know, low income migrants are starting to use uh, formal remittances. And uh, the line chart on the left uh, of the screen also tells us that, you know, as uh, Titus has mentioned earlier, um, the authorized dealers, which are essentially banks, and the ADL A234, who are non-banks, um, if you look at those, uh, you can see that the dark line there, which represents the, bar the banks, it has the highest average transaction size. If you look at the quarterly, um, uh, average sizes from 2016 to quarter one, 2020. And uh, Adla 2, 3, um, and 4, uh, especially Adla 2 and 4 at below 1,000 rands, um, which is indicative that we're seeing more low value transactions and um, the system is slightly more inclusive. So now, going to the volumes. Uh, it is encouraging to also see, looking at the chat uh, at the top of the screen there, uh, again, breaking this down by banks and non-banks. Um, the bank is the dark blue line, and you can see the declining representation uh, of banks within the uh, cross-border remittances, formal cross-border remittances sector between quarter one 2016 and quarter one 2020. Uh, and you can see how Adler 2 dominates. So Adler 2, the distinction between Adler 2 and 3 is that Adler 3 specifically has transaction limits, daily transaction limits of about 5,000 rands and a monthly transaction limit of 25,000 rands. Uh, those transaction limits are not applicable to Adler 2. And Adler 4, as I've mentioned earlier, is where the value remittances lies, the goods remittances. And as I've mentioned, that was introduced uh, in 2018. And as you can see, the gray line starts to emerge there, showing appetite uh, for people needing to send goods back home. And the pie chart also breaks down um, the, 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 the importance of banks and non-banks in this sector. It's also quite critical to note that uh, it is estimated that 83% of the transactions, uh, according to the recent SARP data we got, are actually cash-based. And the implications of that would be elucidated upon uh, as I move on. The values slide is no different from the volumes. As you can see, we have different, uh, well, we have similar trends there with Adla 2 uh, dominating the emergence of Adla 4, the goods remittances. And um, it's also important to note that Adla 4 is essentially a combination of Adla 2 and 3, which is why we see the tail line declining there. Um, it will be interesting to see what this looks like uh, over a longer period of time, but uh, there is no doubt that uh, there is appetite for goods remittances um, in the region. Now, looking at uh, the formal market broken down by gender, um, it, I mean, it, it is, it's a no-brainer that uh, South Africa gets much more male uh, uh, economic migrants. And that is reflected in the volumes uh, chart that's on top of the screen there. As you can see, there are more males uh, uh, sending uh, money in terms of uh, number of transactions. If we look at quarter one 2016 to quarter four 2018, but what is quite important that we would like to show is the table at the bottom of the screen there, especially looking at Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Lesotho. Uh, if you look at the average annual number of remittance transactions, you can see that um, the women from Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Lesotho are sending quite a number of transactions out of South Africa. 
Um, and for uh, institutions and stakeholders that are interested in uh, gender related payment programs, um, it might, uh, this uh, table at the bottom of the screen uh, should give you something to think about. Um, and we can further analyze this data to get into more details, but we thought it was important to show this. Now, going to the informal uh, uh, sector and what is driving uh, the use of informal uh, remittances channels in the region, as we've mentioned, I mean, the key uh, issue here is the fact that a majority of the migrants are actually not legally allowed to work, so they don't have the requisite uh, um, ID or documents to use banks. And at some point or at some level, they also have a perceived uh, 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 sense that they would not be eligible to use formal options. Um, um, another reason is that there are established uh, informal systems like uh, public transport systems and the Awala type of systems. So these informal channels have been said to be actually quite convenient. For instance, uh, the bus, uh, the transport operators going to Zimbabwe, uh, uh, from our qualitative study, we had some reports that uh, some of them could actually deliver to the recipient's doorstep. Um, and if you think about where uh, migrants also reside in the Republic, that is South Africa, usually um, in the in a city, um, they're usually in close proximity to the informal providers and there's a level of trust that's being gained over multiple uses uh, of these informal providers. And they typically have a, a general preference for cash and uh, their level of income is also a key determinant for using informal channels. However, with some of the um, plans from a policy and regulatory perspective and the drivers of market development as uh, Titus had mentioned at the beginning, we should be seeing more of participation in the formal channels, but uh, we'll wait for more data um, as uh, time passes to see how this pans out. Now, the pricing. So in terms of the pricing, the pricing is, is quite interesting because um, Finmark is not the only organization that's looking at pricing. Um, but to start off, um, the methodology uh, that we've uh, pursued in terms of assessing pricing in the region, we uh, uh, went about this through a mystery shopping a process where we actually made uh, payments via uh, uh, service providers to uh, set up countries and then looking at the actual receipts to see um, the cost um, of those transactions. Um, and for those who are not familiar with how generally remittance pricing uh, are calculated, essentially we look at uh, exchange rate, exchange rate margins, um, and then we look at um, the direct transaction costs as well. And then finally, we weight the pricing based on the proportional share of remittances volumes uh, per license categories. This is quite critical because you would notice, as I've shown in the previous uh, uh, slides, that the Adler 2, for instance, uh, is dominating in terms of volumes. So if we do a simple arithmetic uh, uh, average, uh, we would be biasing uh, the pricing because typically the banks, the commercial banks, have higher pricing relative to the rest. So um, what is quite uh, important to notice there is like in the uh, tables, you can see the weighted pricing uh, for the top four um, corridors. Um, again, the, the final reports will show all the different corridors and we'll be sharing that with you. Uh, but the weighted pricing are listed there, 14.6% for Mozambique. If we consider the authorized deal at the banks, 13.6% uh, uh, for Zimbabwe, 96 for Malawi, and 35 for Lesotho. Um, at a SADC total, if you look at 55% a US dollar, uh, you would be looking at 11.2%, uh, 200 is 9.5. Uh, the CMA, uh, which is the uh, common monetary area within the region, uh, that the price in there is actually some of the lowest in the world. But what before uh, I leave this slide, I think it's quite critical to point out, given what I've shown in terms of volumes, that 
uh, from a SADAC perspective, um, we should probably be looking at average pricing uh, uh, based on the non-banks who are actually catering to the majority of the market as opposed to including the authorized dealer uh, within that calculation. And if we do that, and then we'll be looking at average pricing of uh, between five to 7%, which would be uh, some of the most competitive in the world and uh, the SADAC region wouldn't have the uh, uh, unfounded reputation of being uh, some of the most expensive uh, corridors uh, in the world. Uh, it's also quite important to also mention that it, the, the average uh, transaction size at which we calculate uh, uh, pricing uh, is quite key. So as I've shown earlier, transaction sizes are within $55 to about $70 on an average within the region. So looking at average pricing at a US dollar 200 is probably not applicable in the region as well. Market innovation, I'm gonna breeze through this. Um, what we're seeing is that uh, some of the remittance service providers are starting to attach uh, or link to mobile wallets in recipient countries. Uh, this has led to um, uh, quite a bit of uptake, especially in Malawi, um, this uh, uh, report uh, of, uh, of remittances uh, uh, service providers linking with mobile money operators in Malawi and Mozambique, uh, which facilitates uh, 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 inflows straight into the wallet. As I've mentioned, uh, the Adler 4, the value remittances service, which is really taken off. And obviously, uh, from a regulatory perspective, the risk-based assessment has also seen uh, quite a lot of uh, um, low income, uh, low value uh, 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 transactions coming into the formal space. From an opportunity perspective, as I've mentioned, 83% of the transactions are still cash-based. And as we know, uh, the first mile is where uh, 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 part of the drivers of costing uh, is quite critical in terms of cash handling fees. But what happens in South Africa is that a digital store of value at the moment is only uh, uh, provided by commercial banks. And hopefully as we go into the future and non-banks are allowed to have uh, digital store of value uh, products, we can start to see uh, uh, much more uh, remittances going off fully digital rails, which would further bring down the pricing. And obviously the RBA assessment would also be quite critical in this regard. Impact of COVID. So as I've said, uh, a lot of the transactions are mainly cash-based. Uh, for cash transactions, there is a lot of support provided by agents, either roving or stationary. And since COVID started there's, uh, and the lockdowns that have ensued, uh, a lot of the agents who are also small businesses are not regarded as essential uh, businesses. And this has led to the following drops in the market. So from uh, the conversations we've had with some of our stakeholders that are uh, remittance service providers, uh, we've seen about 38% drop in the volumes from March to April 2020 in the Lesotho Corridor. Um, we've seen about 51% drop between March and April uh, in the Mozambique Corridor, and about 79% drop in volumes between March and April for the Malawi Corridor. Um, and obviously, uh, once we start getting uh, details uh, of uh, April 2020 data from Saab, which we'll probably get around June, we can get a, a better sense of a total market perspective in this regard. Uh, from a COVID recovery perspective, uh, we are saying that the migrants probably need access to more formal digital store value options and uh, the risk-based assessments will play a critical role there. My final slide here goes to uh, country level uh, 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 analysis on this and I've looked at uh, the key four corridors here. Uh, again, Adler 2 dominating for Zimbabwe, uh, the bank's uh, diminishing role um, Adla 4 is coming into the fray. Mozambique, we can see there's a huge appetite for uh, goods remittances there. Um, for Malawi, goods remittances in Adla 2 is really taken off. And in Lesotho, uh, Adla 2 and uh, the banks are still 
uh, quite competitive there. Lesotho, uh, it sh I should mention that Lesotho is part of the common monetary area, which is why uh, usage of banks is slightly more competitive. And with that said, that brings me to the end of the presentation and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Komoto, do we have any? Yes, thank you, Damola. Um, yeah. So we have a few questions from the audience. In fact, one came through yesterday. Yeah. Um, so the question reads, from the figures show, showing decline in remittances by migrants due to adv the advent of the pandemic, COVID-19 and the lockdown, yeah. can this be viewed as an opportunity for financial inclusion of this untapped market? How can service providers seize the opportunity in di redirecting remittances to formal channels even after this episode? business will not be able to go on as, as usual, therefore new insights are required. Thank you for that. Uh, I think that is an important uh, uh, question. So in as far as we think of South Africa as an economic hub and there is a original drive to integrate uh, the financial systems, specifically around cross-border payments, there is also original drive for financial inclusion. And given the fact that there are economic migrants moving between borders, financial inclusion can no longer be a thing that is domestically driven. It has to have a regional take. So obviously, if you have a situation with 80% of migrants working in the informal sector or might not have the, the, the correct type of ID, we need to ensure that our economies are much more inclusive, which then uh, 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 you know, puts into uh, the, the driving seat of the role of non-banks, the role of uh, much more lenient uh, KYC uh, 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 regulation, which we are pushing in terms of the uh, risk-based assessment as well. Um, and obviously uh, the, the outcome of, of that uh, would uh, uh, help us check the box in terms of a regional financial inclusion uh, uh, expansion. Thank you for that. And just following on to the piece about identification that you spoke about, Nadia would like to find out, can you also advise on, on the issue of identification? How can this be resolved? Well, so identification is an interesting one as well. Um, and you have different uh, stories here. So in some countries, uh, the national ID system um, is at, uh, it, it has a certain level of sophisticatedness uh, relative to others. In Lesotho, there's a biometric system that might not be the case in other uh, uh, countries. Uh, what we're thinking about from a cross-border remittance perspective is, um, is a digital financial ID system that transcends borders. Um, and this is one of the areas in which we are looking at and we're trying uh, to pilot within the region and we welcome uh, partnership and ideas uh, in terms of how this could work given our endowments as I've mentioned in terms of uh, the way in which uh, national ID systems are calibrated. Um, the fact that you might have uh, financial service providers that have subsidiary uh, uh, of, uh, of their institutions within the region and how can we leverage on those kinds of institutions as well. You know, your standard banks, your FMBs have, um, have a presence across the region. So how can we use some of these uh, to uh, uh, ensure that one, we can leverage a regional digital financial ID system. We can also be able to ping uh, and be able to ensure that regional KYC is possible, uh, given the fact that there would be uh, a system in which uh, has a regional reach and different financial service providers can have access to such databases. Thank you, Damola. Um, that was a very 
clear response, thank you. Um, we have another question, this one's from Innocent, and he'd like to find out, have we established why banks are more expensive, including recipient banks in some countries? I don't know if either yourself or Titus would like to tackle that one. Titus, can I, can I leave that to you? Why banks are expensive? I mean, I would say it's the business model, but um, Titus? Uh, uh, I'll take this one. Cool. Yes, uh, banks are expensive because the products that have been developed in banks, they are not traditional remittance uh, uh, products, uh, uh, products. As I've mentioned in my uh, opening remarks, in the absence of uh, remittance products uh, in the market, uh, people were using what we call um, telegraphic transfers or swift transfers in, in South Africa. And those uh, transactions, uh, those products are meant for high value uh, uh, transfers. In other words, you'll be transferring something like say a million or 200 million interbank uh, transfer using that service. What ended up happening was that then uh, uh, people, in the absence of products in the market, people used uh, those uh, services. But if you look in the, 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 the CMA region, um, there is a, a service um, uh, which we call EFT uh, that is available only uh, between the, the, the four countries. And that service um, requires a bank-to-bank -bank, uh, transfer. And it is cheaper because it has been uh, designed for a transfer of funds uh, of uh, low value funds for uh, transferring money to a person or uh, uh, using it as a payment service to a, a service service provider. But that service is not available across SADC. So now what happens is that then people ended up, you, as an example, if you wanted to transfer money to say uh, Angola or you want to transfer money to, to Botswana, um, in the absence of the, the product like your South Africa Lesotho, a ShopRite a, a product in the absence of that and in the absence of the, the EFT service that we have in the CMA countries, you end up using what is available, which is your telegraphic transfer or which is the bank services. And those are the expensive channels to use. But like I said, that uh, there is work in progress to develop uh, a, a platform uh, across the uh, SADEC that uh, will enable transfer of funds from a bank account, bank account, from a bank account to a wallet and from a wallet to wallet. We hope that once that is uh, implemented, you will start seeing a competition in that market because you not only have banks participating there, you will have your money transfer operators, you will have your your telco operators uh, in that space, and then there will be uh, different uh, services that will emerge from that uh, uh, platform uh, of which service providers then will be able to compete on price and service in the market. Thank you. Thank you, Titus. Um, we're going to take three more questions, and then I will just put Damola's details up so that you can engage further with him if your question doesn't get responded to. Um, so there's a question from Leon that speaks to Mozambique. So he has noted that there are a high number of migrants in South Africa from Mozambique, but the number of transactions are relatively low at about 7,000. Um, so he'd like to find out, can you please outline why this, these transaction numbers might be so low for Mozambique? So um, in those countries where the number of migrants are high, but the number of transactions appear to be low, um, can you infer what the reasons for that might be? Thank you for that. So, uh, it, 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 so we, so the the, the country level um, uh, slides that I put up. I'm not sure the one that uh, Leon is referring to, either the line chart or the table. So, from the line chart perspective, of looking from a quarterly perspective, if we look at a yearly perspective. Uh, Mozambique is actually in the top three uh, from a transaction, number of transaction uh, 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 standpoint. So the top three uh, of corridors in terms of volumes is actually Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Malawi. Um, and the situation looks quite different once we aggregate uh, to a yearly uh, uh, 
uh, level. Um, that would be my response to you. In terms of what is driving uh, the disparity between the numbers, if you think about the high uh, 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 um, number of migrants versus what we see in terms of what's passing through the formal remittances channels, uh, I think that would require uh, a dedicated survey looking at uh, Mozambican uh, uh, migrants specifically. It's not something that um, I can speak on. It would be uh, essentially speculative. Thank you, Damola. Our second last question. Uh, this is from Douglas, and he'd like to find out whether you have any idea about the corridor prices in the informal sector. We have, so the, 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 the network of informal uh, remittance and service providers uh, within the Republic is quite vast. And for us to get to a point to then ascertain what um, the pricing looks like would require quite a bit of effort from a research perspective. Um, we do know from our qualitative study that uh, the transport uh, providers would charge up to between 10 to 30 percent um, of the value that is being uh, sent um, across border. Um, and then you have, especially in DRC, where you have some, some of these informal hawala types um, that would charge um, something similar between 10, 20 percent. But uh, for us to speak authoritatively about pricing within the informal uh, remittances space, um, I, I don't think uh, we're in a position to do that. Uh, we can infer or estimate what it is, as I've mentioned, but um, uh, it, it would be intellectually dishonest to say we're speaking authoritatively on that. Thank you, Damola. And then our last question is from Florence, and she would like to find out now the due to COVID-19 and its implications on remittances, particularly those who rely on remittances in order to gain a livelihood and to receive basic goods and services. So the question speaks to two points, the first of which being, what would, what would be the policy and regulatory requirement for fa facilitating outbound transfers in light of um, outbreaks such as COVID? And also, Damola, if you could also just end this off with speaking about um, just the responses um, specific to remittances and COVID-19, um, and perhaps also just touch on the Migrant Relief Fund. Sure. Uh, so I, I don't quite understand Florence's question. Um, during a COVID, such a pandemic where um, we have uh, a, a, a virus that is highly transmittable, um, I'm sh governments are trying to limit um, the incidence uh, of this transmission by uh, limiting uh, our abilities to travel, because if we do not travel, then the virus doesn't travel. Um, and what this means is that um, within South Africa and even in recipient countries, um, I would, if I were the government, I, I would encourage digital financial services and digital financial transactions uh, to limit um, face to face and people um, being in a position to uh, transmit. So uh, to get to the point where a vast majority of people who are uh, excluded from uh, having formal digital store value uh, 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 services or products, it would be to ramp up um, uh, the, the, the onboarding of such uh, cohorts or clients uh, through uh, regulatory dispensations such as the risk-based assessments, as I've mentioned earlier, to ensure that people have digital platforms in which they're able to, uh, uh, to send money back home. And from the perspective that we have uh, migrants within the region that are actually stuck in South Africa at the moment, uh, just to round up this uh, conversation, uh, Finmark Trust, uh, uh, with our funders and some of our partners, uh, we are looking to develop a migrant support fund, uh, a migrant relief support fund, uh, a fund that will be channeled through the non-bank 
uh, uh, remittance service providers um, sort of to leverage on the low cost that uh, 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 transactions via their platforms would, uh, uh, um, would uh, uh, result in, and then get uh, the funds to recipient families back home. Uh, I know this, that not, this might be contentious, that why aren't we supporting uh, the migrants that are stuck here? But if you think about this, uh, a lot of the migrants, uh, economic migrants that have come to South Africa have left uh, uh, people back home that are actually fully dependent on the money being sent back, uh, sent, sent back home. So Finmark at the moment is looking at uh, putting together a, a, a relief fund that ensures that over the next uh, uh, two, three months that um, the migrant recipient families are able to get the 20, uh, 25 uh, odd dollars that they receive on a monthly basis. And with that said, um, I'd like to thank everyone that has participated um, in this uh, webinar. Um, I'd like to thank my colleague Titus uh, for honoring the invitation and um, everybody that has attended all your questions. Uh, um, and please uh, contact me directly if you want to engage further on this. My uh, uh, contact details are on the screen. I'd like to thank my colleagues for help facilitating uh, this webinar. Um, and um, uh, we'll be sharing uh, the uh, full reports uh, from this research. Uh, and um, please get in touch with us and let's uh, take this conversation forward. Uh, with that said, um, the webinar is closed. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.